All right, y'all. So I just recorded parts one and two. Took a whole 80, 90 minutes or whatever. Um, now I'm recording part three and I'm kind of tired, but I will make it through this. So this is part three of my top 30 favorite movies. This is numbers uh, number 10 through one, right? Um, so yeah, let's just get into it. And uh, here we go. Um, I can't wait to show you. Um, so yeah, number 10 is Goodfellas. Martin Scorsese, in my opinion, the best mob movie director. He's done, you know, Mean Streets, Goodfellas, uh, Casino's a mob movie, right? Um, but he does, he's done a bunch of different things. Uh, Goodfellas is, is like, this is my favorite mob movie because it's like amazing. Like it goes through all these different characters, you know, Henry Hill and uh, Tommy DeVito and uh, Jimmy... Wait, what's Robert De Niro's character's name? You know what I'm talking about. But um, I've seen this movie like a billion times. Like, it's got a great soundtrack. It's got a great story, the narration and everything, and, you know, the long camera takes. And Well, there's one in particular where they're walking through the kitchen. You know what I'm talking about. Um, this movie is just super iconic. I mean, uh, everyone knows Goodfellas. I'm sure everybody's seen Goodfellas. Uh, Joe Pesci, phenomenal performance, won an Oscar for it, gave like a two-second speech. <laughs> uh, you know... Henry Hill, played by Ray Liotta, great character, uh, based on real events, too, which is crazy. Uh, I don't know, this movie's just, like, it's super great, like, uh, and it takes place over, like, a whole one decade, probably, right, or something like that, a lot of years. Uh, but, yeah, it just shows the rise and fall of a, of a of an empire, pretty much, a whole mafia uh, crime family, I guess you could call it, but uh, Goodfellas is just... It's super, it's so iconic, and it's just part of, it's really part of movie history, really. Um, for me, like I said, I've seen it a billion times, it's just, it never gets old. Like, you could just watch it and just, yeah, <laughs> I don't know how much else to say, but Goodfellas, masterpiece. Mob movie masterpiece. Alright, um, coming up at number nine is Ghostbusters, yes. Ghostbusters is... One of my favorite movies of all time, obviously, number nine. Um, it's got so many quotable lines. It's got so many funny characters, so many funny moments, so many, I don't know, just great things about it. Um, just, you know, Bill Murray, Sigourney Weaver, um, Rick Moranis, uh, Harold, Ramis, Harold Ramis, sorry, almost kind of mixed their names there. You know, uh, just a great cast. Uh, everybody knows Ghostbusters. The new one can go to hell. I'm, not, I'm never going to watch the new Ghostbusters movie. I refuse to. Um, the second movie's okay, but, you know, uh, the first one's the masterpiece. I mean, it's just such a part of everyone, you know, our culture. Um, who are you going to call Ghostbusters? You know, uh, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I don't have much else to say, but Ghostbusters is like, it's amazing. It's a great comedy. It's a great... Uh, not horror movie, I guess ghost movie, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just got everything in it. It's just a fun movie. It's it's Ghostbusters is great and you know great soundtrack. Uh, so you notice when I get into my top, the higher I go on the list, the less words I have to ex say for these movies because like I can't express their greatness in words. Um, but everybody knows Ghostbusters. It's just that good of a movie. Uh, yeah, so that's number nine right there, Ghostbusters. All right. Number eight, more recent movie, Blade Runner 2049. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, do you have this higher than Blade Runner, the first Blade Runner? You know what? Here's a little spoiler. No, I do not. The first Blade Runner is obviously going to be in this video because, you know, these are my last, this is my last uh, video I'm making here. Um, I think the first Blade Runner is better, but this movie is a damn good sequel that at first I thought was better than the first Blade Runner, but I've changed my mind on that. Um... This movie is a masterpiece, okay? The fact that um, we got an art house sci-fi dystopian movie, um, science fiction movie, in the year 2017, that's almost three hours long, made with a pretty good budget, is crazy to think. Because in this day and age, you don't see movies like this um, in, in the mainstream, right? Um, and even the director, Denis Villeneuve, has said he might not be able to make a movie like this again because, you know, it didn't do so hot at the box office, right? Um, but this is what you call a masterpiece because it it's like, it takes everything that worked in the first movie and expands them in every way you can think. Um, Story-wise, character-wise, um, even aesthetically-wise because 
back in 1982, I think it was, the first movie came out, or 3, 1983? No, 1982, I think. Um, obviously, that's 30-something years, almost 40 years ago. You don't have the money or the special effects to make a movie like that. But nowadays, with this technology, you can make a movie that looks and feels just like the old one, but, like, in a bigger sense. Um, the special effects and the visuals in this are nuts. Um, this movie is so beautiful to look at. Um... I'm so happy that this exists on a 4K disc because every time I watch it now, it's just it's like oh my god. Uh, the soundtrack's phenomenal, the acting's phenomenal. The it's it's a pure masterpiece. Like this movie is so good. I was surprised at how good it was when I saw it because if you watch my movie review for this, the first thing I say I think is like this is one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life, and it really is. Uh, I almost want to put it like even higher. Like I know it's at number uh, eight number eight on my list but i even want to put it higher but i i kind of can't because the other movies just do something more for me um but this movie is like perfect like it's so good um i was surprised at how good it was and yes the first blade runner i think is a, is better but i'll get to that later it's just man this is a great movie right here ryan gosling excuse me ryan gosling uh, did a great job in this uh, the whole cast did a great job harrison ford did a very good job as, like, a, you know, broken down kind of bitter character. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I, I clearly love this movie because, um, especially because I have all the pops on display on my desk over there. And you see those in all my videos. Um, man, Blade Runner for 2049 is just amazing. Like, really good. Okay, number seven is the first Back to the Future. Now I got the whole big box set right here, but... uh the second movie uh, is good. The third... No, the second one's okay. I used to love the second one, but I notice all the flaws it has nowadays. Uh, the third one's better than the second one, I think. But the first Back to the Future, it's no contest. It's obviously the best one. Um, Back to the Future is so much of my childhood that, like, uh, anytime I watch it, I just it's just, like, so nostalgic. Um, first Back to the Future is almost a perfect movie. Uh, it's It's got comedy it's got drama it's got action it's got suspense it's got it's got everything in it it's like a pure mix of everything pure fun movie uh so many memorable lines memorable characters biff doc brown marty mcfly george mcfly everybody the, the, einstein the dog <laughs> um everyone knows back to the future i mean flux capacitor 88 miles per hour uh, it's such a part of our culture you know i always link ghostbusters and back to the future kind of in the same realm sort of um but i've always liked back to the future more just a, like a little bit more um i love ghostbusters though but back to the future just does something more um for me um great soundtrack power of love huey lewis in the news you, you know you can't you can't beat that um champion under the sea dance uh johnny be good i mean i don't know i don't have much else to say uh everyone knows back to the future is like amazing um and this should be in everybody's top 10 favorite movies uh you know uh, you, oh you can't say what should be in my list yeah i'm saying that this should be in your top 10 movies because it, it everyone should know back to the future everyone should love back to the future is there anyone that doesn't like back to the future right now please tell me i'm talking about just the first movie okay um is there anybody that doesn't like back to the future please tell me or have you heard of anyone that doesn't like it because they're crazy okay uh <laughs> Number six is The Big Lebowski. Now, um, I mentioned in part one that my top five favorite movies changed because my number one favorite movie changed. So numbers two through six here used to be my numbers one through five. So this used to be number five, but recently I changed it. Now, um, Big Lebowski. Now, I've gone on about this movie a million times, but this movie has got the best quotes, best funny moments, um, you know, he peed on the rug, man. Uh, everyone's seen this. Everyone knows the Big Lebowski's, like, great. Uh, Coen Brothers, I'm a big fan of theirs. They did Fargo, No Country for Old Men. It's hard to think that the people that made this movie made No Country for Old Men because they're completely different tonally. Um, they did the True Grit remake, which is a, one of the better remakes. Um, but Big Lebowski, man, it doesn't get better than this. John Goodman, Jeff Bridges, Steve Buscemi, um, Julianne Moore, and uh, John Turturro. Who, he's supposed to be getting a spinoff movie that's coming out this year, right? Um, what's going on with that? Anybody else hear about that? Um, yeah, I can't say anything else about it. This movie is infinitely rewatchable. You can watch it anytime. 
Um, it's always fun. It never gets old. It's it's amazing. There's a whole Lebowski fest dedicated to this movie. Um, yeah, Big Lebowski. Everybody knows it's great. Anyways, okay, <laughs> coming in at number five, which used to be number four, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, the best action movie of all time. I don't care what you say. Everyone knows it. Um, Terminator 1 is great. Terminator 3, no. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the sequels. No, just stop. Terminator 1 and 2, that's all you need to watch. Forget the rest. Um, this movie is an, a masterpiece. James Cameron made a masterpiece. Um, I watched this movie at a very young age, and I remember the first time watching it, I was just blown away. I was like, wow, what did I just watch? Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the hero. This is this is one of my movie, favorite movie characters of all time. This this uh, Terminator, this T-800 in particular, not the one from the first movie, even though that was a great character also, great performance, very intimidating, but he's much better as the hero in this. Robert Patrick is the T-1000, one of the best villains of all time. I mean, Jesus Christ, how scary was he when you, you know, when you're young and you first watch this movie that I almost had nightmares from that character. He was so scary. Um, this movie is a, I, I can't express, um, and I love the 4K, by the way, that just came out for this, this right here. It looks great. Um, the action sequences are amazing. Um, I don't know, and at his core, too, it's it's kind of like, you know, about a family, about Sarah Connor, John Connor, he's kind of the father figure, and, you know, there's that scene where uh, Sarah's looking at John Connor and him, you know, playing together and stuff, and she's like, you know, this robot, this machine could be, a you know, more of a father than, uh, you know, whoever his actual, you know, any other person could be, um, you know, his actual father, Kyle Reese, died in the first movie, but, um, I don't know, man, this movie... And it's very emotional, too, what happens at the end. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's pure masterpiece. I don't, I can't really explain it. Everyone knows. Terminator 2, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, and this used to be, oh, I have to mention, this used to be my number one favorite movie for many years. Um, it really was. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's since gone down a little bit, but I still love it. I, it's at number five now, but Terminator 2... Pure masterpiece right there. Okay, now, number four is Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Another Martin Scorsese movie. Oh, this pile is falling over. Excuse me, bear with me for a moment. I need to fix this. Okay, now the thing with Taxi Driver. This also used to be my number one favorite movie for many years. This actually dethroned Terminator 2. Um, now, the thing about Taxi Driver, um, this is definitely a character piece about Travis Bickle here, uh, played by Robert De Niro. One of the best performances of all time. Um, the thing I like about this movie is how much you can relate to this guy. The fact that he has to deal with, you know, his views on humanity and people. You know, he lives in 1970s New York, which obviously, if, when you watch this movie, was not a good place. People always, like, point out how nice New York is nowadays when you look at it from, like, 40, 30 years ago, how disgusting New York used to be. Um... But he lives amongst the filth and the, and the scum. And, you know, there's a part where he calls people filth and scum and stuff like that. But you can just tell this guy is like, um, you can see, like, he's like kind of a black sheep. He, like, he doesn't fit in with all these people. He tries to, uh, you know, date Sybil Shepherd here. Um, and it doesn't work out. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a, a crazy anti-hero this introduced the anti-hero right i think this is the first time in movies we saw an anti-hero maybe um or i could be wrong but i think this came out in 1976 right i think it was the year um yeah it was because rocky came out the same year and people are like always debating should this have won best picture or rocky and rocky won because it's a more feel-good movie and yeah i think this is better than rocky in my opinion just because i can relate to it more um but it's all about you know it's really about how you view other people and how others view you and stuff like that. And and he kind of goes crazy at the end of the movie, but he does it in a, he does the right thing. He tries to save young Jodie Foster right here. Um, you know, I don't want to give everything away if you haven't seen it, but he does bad things, but he does it for the right reason. And, you know, he wants things to go a certain way for them, but they don't. So he ends up shaving his head and doing something crazy. But, um, you know, the writer of this movie linked it to, like, uh, I think, mentioned that... Oh, what, what's his name? Paul Schrader, I think, wrote this movie. He's a great writer. Um, there's a girl he wants but can't get. There's a girl he doesn't want but does is able to not get but save her from, you know, 
the scum of the earth or whatever he calls these people um, that live in New York. Um, Harvey Keitel's character, um, Sport, right? This is this is a great movie. It's got so many things going on in it. It's just uh, it's a great look at humanity and how how evil people are and how uh, you know somebody like this, a fish out of water, you know how he deals in that, how he deals with the situation, how he deals with the place that he's living in and the people he's surrounded by. Um, I really can't explain it, but Taxi Driver is a masterpiece, and everyone knows it's great. But you really need to look at it from this guy's point of view, as like you know. I don't want to be with these people. I don't like these people I'm surrounded by. This place I live, it's just... I don't know. You have to look at it that way. But, uh... Oh, and there's a great scene. Um, right here, I gotta show you. Uh, Martin Scorsese has a cameo in the movie. Right here. Um, this is, like, one of the best parts... One of the best times a director played a cameo in a movie. Um, I know a lot of directors play parts in their own movies. But this is, like, one of the better instances of it. Um, it just shows you, like, wow. <laughs> Like, especially being a taxi driver, that's the whole idea. You you meet all these people that are, like, crazy. And, uh, yeah, just great movie. I don't know how, I can't really, I can't do it justice. But, uh, anyways. All right, uh, coming in at number three here is Apocalypse Now. Now, this was my number two, but now it's number three. I have to get used to that now, because uh, I changed my list, my top five. I always had a set top five for, like, a long time, but now it's different. Um... In my opinion, this is the greatest film ever made. Um, why? Okay. Francis Ford Coppola, who directed this, he directed The Godfather, Godfather 2, all three of them. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that would have been easier to say. Um, he already made those great movies, but he made this, and... Um, wait, yeah, this was after Godfather 1 and 2, right? Yeah, it was. Um, now, here's the thing. This was made in the 70s, the late 70s. Um, during which, you know, the Vietnam War um, was still going on, I think, right? When he was filming this. But he, he did not film this in Vietnam, I think. Um, but the thing is, to make a movie like this, um, in the jungle, with tensions like this still happening, okay? Um, this conflict still happening. And shooting thousands of hours of footage. So, reportedly, he shot thousands of hours of footage for this movie. Um, dealing with all these struggles, you know, on set and... Uh, you know, Martin Sheen almost died, actually, from getting, like, food poisoning or something like that. Um, he, he got some sort of sickness that almost killed him. Francis Ford Coppola almost, like, drove himself to suicide, he said, when he was making this movie. Um, he had Marlon Brando on the movie, you know, kind of working a tight schedule and, you know, being hard to work with and stuff. It's just, the way you look at how this movie was made, it's like, okay, this is, like, the toughest thing to ever make. Um, and I think it's the greatest film of, of all time because... This movie, okay, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like, um, this is such a visceral experience. Um, for me, personally, I like movies that are like super long, that take you on a journey, right? Like three hour long epics, kind of like Blade Runner 2049 is like a three hour epic, right? This is a three hour epic, especially the Redux version, the longer cut of this. I know some people don't like the Redux version because it adds so many long scenes in it, but I like it more. I'm like, oh, there's a longer version? Sign me up, I'll watch that. <laughs> I like the Redux version more because, you know, it has more in it. Um, you get more Marlon Brando scenes, too. I mean, you can't argue with that. Um, I think it's just one extra scene with him. But anyways, uh, I have a thing for movies that are super long. They take you on this journey with all these characters, and it has an epic finale um, when you get to um, Walter E. Kurtz, right? That's his character's name right there, Colonel Kurtz. You know, the horror, the horror. Um, I won't give that away if you, if you haven't seen it. But, uh... It's just an epic movie that takes you on this huge journey. Um, I, I can't really explain it. Like, it's just... I just like movies that are like that. Um, they're so masterful, and they have all these great moments. The scene with, you know, I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. And you got young Lawrence Fishburne dancing on the boat. Um, this is just... It's a... It's an amazing movie. Like, I, there's nothing that's better than this, in my opinion. Like, in terms of, like, a Mastercraft, you know, filmmaking accomplishment. Like, uh, it just took so much work to make. Um, you know, I, I can't explain it. Like, <laughs> anybody else get what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? Am I making sense? Um, but the fact that it was such a challenge to make this movie, and it turned out as good as it did, um, is a real testament to, like, these people's talent, like Francis Ford Coppola, he's got to be, 
no argument. One of the best directors of all time. Like, you gotta put him in, like, the top five or something like that. Um, yeah, and, you know, you got Robert Duvall in there, you know, for a great part. Um, Martin Sheen's great. You got all these great moments. And, you know, Marlon Brando gives one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life in this. Um, as a broken character who's been, you know, he's been changed by the war and he's living in seclusion and he's shaved his head and he's he's going on with all these long anecdotes and and uh the decision martin sheen makes at the end of the movie where he kind of goes a little nuts um this is a this is what you call a masterpiece right here i just i could go on and on but i can't i can't really explain why i think it's the best movie of all time um best film ever made but it's not my number one favorite obviously I've, i have it at number three now but uh it is a great movie like, if you have the time, please watch. I think the regular version's two hours and a few minutes, maybe. The Redux version is, like, three hours, and I prefer that one personally, but you don't have to watch that one. Uh, phenomenal movie, man. Um, I can't really explain it, like I said, so I'm just going to stop. Uh, Apocalypse Now, best war movie ever made, I think. Um, number two. Now, this was my number one for many years. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly with Clint Eastwood. Now, uh... This is the Dollars Trilogy, or as it's known now, the Man With No Name Trilogy. But A Fistful of Dollars, I love that movie. For a few dollars more, I think is even better. Um, but I personally like A Fistful of Dollars a little more. You know, my personal take. But Good, the Mad, and the Ugly is a masterpiece. Um, Ennio Morricone's music in all three of these movies is great, but especially Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, because you got the Ecstasy of Gold in there. you got the main theme that's iconic. Um... Chris Stuckman, who is a movie reviewer on YouTube, recently reviewed The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. His review is better review than I could ever give, because clearly I just go off on a tangent. I don't really script it or anything. But he's a great movie reviewer. Check out his review for this movie if you want to know how good it is, because um, he did a great review. But Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is just a perfect movie. Like, not perfect, but like it's like a Western masterpiece. Sergio Leone is one of those directors that just gets better with each movie. Um he, he's definitely one of the greatest of all time, no question. But you could tell, like, as each movie went on, he just got better and better. Because The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, the third one, is it blows the other two out of the water. Um, I also saw his other movie, Once Upon a Time in the West. And that one also is a masterpiece. I mean, geez. I only watched it once, though. I wish I... I, I don't own it. Um, I had to watch it online for a film class. But um, if I had it, I'd probably watch it a bunch more times. And it probably would have been on my top 30 movies. But unfortunately, like I said, I only watched it once, so... But that movie was really good. And you could tell, like I said, he just got better and better with each movie. And I wish he was still alive, but, you know, he passed away um, a long time ago. Um, but The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and I was such a Clint Eastwood fan, too, you know, when I watched this. Um, just a great movie. Great trio of characters. Eli Wallach, who plays Tuco, he's he's actually, the, like, the main character of the movie, if you really look at it. Um, he's a phenomenal character. Um Rest in peace to Eli Wallach, who passed away, uh, I think it was 2014, actually. I remember hearing that news and just being like, oh, man, because he almost made it to be 100 years old, but, you know, he didn't live that long. He was, like, 94, I think, when he died, or 95. And, uh, you know, Lee Van Cleef plays Angel Eyes, great villain, great antagonist. But the trio of characters, man, in this, it's just, especially with uh, Clint Eastwood's character, nickname is Blondie. Blondie and Tuco, they have a great dynamic with each other. and I don't know, man. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is just, like, it's pure classic. Um, it's 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 a masterpiece, man. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody knows it. Everybody's familiar with it in some shape or form. Um, yeah, it was my number one movie for many years until 2017, which is when I decided to change my favorite movie. And I mentioned it earlier. You're probably like, wait, what was it? Oh, yeah, you mentioned that movie earlier, but you haven't gotten to it yet. So I'm about to talk, to, talk about it right now. But Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is my number two favorite movie now. So, yeah, it's official. All right. My number one favorite movie. I mentioned it earlier. It is Blade Runner. Okay. Um, how do I explain this? Okay, it's Blade Runner, the final cut, okay? Now, let me try to explain how this came to be. So, I watched this movie maybe... I, okay, let me say I tried watching it maybe four years ago, three years ago, something like that. And I didn't like it, right? I watched the reg. Let me let me mention. I watched the theatrical version because I have this opinion, okay? I'm like, if you're gonna watch a movie for the first time, watch the theatrical version because that's the version you're supposed to watch. You know, in my mind. Um, so I said, okay, 
I want to watch this Blade Runner movie because I owned it. You know, I heard about it. I bought the movie. I was like, oh, everybody says Blade Runner. That's one of those better sci-fi movies. And, you know, it's one of Harrison Ford's most better known movies. So I'll buy this Blade Runner movie, right? And I take it home and I tried watching it, but I just couldn't... I didn't even finish the movie. I was just like, what is... I couldn't understand what was happening. Um, I didn't really like it. Okay. So then flash forward to 2017, right? We got Blade Runner 2049 coming out. I was like, oh yeah, that's a sequel to Blade Runner, but I never finished watching that. And I watched the trailer for 2049, and it looked awesome. I was like, oh, this movie looks amazing. And, you know, it's got this great director. It's got Ryan Gosling, who I'm a big fan of, by the way. Um, I love Drive. I really, I wish I included Drive on this list now that I think about it. I'm a big fan of Drive. Um, anyways, so I'm like, okay, I'm probably going to go watch 2049, because it looks like this big epic, like I said, I like those three-hour journey big movies like that. Um, Good, the Bad, the Ugly is I didn't mention it's like a three hour epic movie too um so I was like okay I'm gonna go see 2049 because it looks awesome it looks great and I'll give Blade Runner another chance let me rewatch Blade Runner and then I'll watch 2049 so what I went and did I watched the theatrical version again like an idiot because <laughs> everyone knows the theatrical version is like the weakest cut of this movie because there's a voiceover narration that the studio forced Harrison Ford to do and anyways um so I watched the whole thing, and, you know, if you've seen this movie, you know the character Roy Batty, played by uh, Rutger Hauer, is is what makes this movie as great as it is, right? Um, and I finally saw the Tears in the Rain scene, because I hadn't seen that years ago when I first tried watching this. And it changed the whole movie for me. I was like, this is different. This is, this is not just a sci-fi movie. This is not just a, a mystery, crime-solving cop movie or whatever. Um, so then I was like... I'm curious about all these other cuts, right? Because this movie has a bunch of different versions. There's like a work print version, international version, director's cut, final cut, whatever. So I went and looked, um, and it's always advertised, you know, these recent releases. Um, I got this one. This is a 4K one. This is not the one I was watching initially. Um, I have another one, but it was being advertised as like the final, Blade Runner, the final cut. On the spine, it said the final cut. On the front, it said the final cut. So I'm like, okay, I think I'm supposed to watch the final cut, right? Because disc one was the final cut, and I think like a different disc was the theatrical. So I was like, I should have watched the final cut first. So I went and watched the final cut, and I was like, okay, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I shouldn't have watched the theatrical one first. Forget everything I said about watching a theatrical cut first. Because the final cut is what is my favorite movie of all time now. Um, first of all, the visuals are improved immensely with the final cut. Um, the whole look of the movie is amazing the 4k by the way this ultra hd one is beautiful um so the visuals were improved completely back in uh, 2007 i think they made that final cut right they it's pretty much a remaster they added in a few scenes and it's just way better they got rid of the stupid voiceover narration that was in the theatrical cut that wasn't meant to be there um anyways i'm gonna stop talking about the theatrical cut but okay blade runner is a cut above the rest because it's got such an atmosphere right everyone okay everyone already knows the movie's got a great soundtrack by vangelis beautiful music tears in the rain especially oh my god so good um or tears in rain sorry don't want to offend anybody that's a fan of this movie it's tears in rain not tears in the rain um the music is phenomenal in this i used to go to sleep every night um afterwards after watching the final cut of this I would uh, pull up the soundtrack for this movie and play the whole soundtrack on my TV, you know, on my PlayStation, on YouTube or whatever. And I would just go to bed listening to the Blade Runner music because it was so calming and so relaxing. Um, also, this movie's got such an atmosphere to it. It's always raining. It's always like nighttime. The whole world of this movie is amazing. The soundtrack's amazing. The characters are all memorable. You got, you know, Deckard, of course, Rachel, um, Tyrell, Roy Batty. Gaff, uh, J.F. Sebastian, uh, Pris. I could just go on about naming these characters, but I really fell in love with this movie like no other movie I've fell in love with before. Like, I've never, I've never fallen in love with the movie so much. And the thing is that helped it is when I went to watch Blade Runner 2049, and I was like, whoa. That even made me fall in love with this movie more. Because I was like, okay, I want to go back and rewatch this again. And... I don't know, I just, I fell in love with the movie. It's really, it, like I said, what I mentioned earlier, 
the whole Roy Batty character and story arc and Rutger Hauer's performance and the whole Tears and, Tears and Rain monologue is what makes this movie the masterpiece that it is, really, because his character is the heart and soul of this. Because at first, you're like thinking he's a bad guy. He's the antagonist. He technically is the antagonist, but he's actually... All he wants, his goal, is to live longer. He wants to live, and he can't get that. So once he realizes that he's going to... you know, I, I don't want to give spoilers, I'm sorry, but... Man, this movie, <laughs> it, it's it's that good. Like, I just fell in love with the movie. And I was surprised, because I was like, you know what? I gave this movie a chance a couple years ago, and I tried watching it. It just didn't work for me, and I didn't finish it. I regret not falling in love with this movie before, because now I've fallen in love with it. And it became my number one favorite movie, because I just constantly... I just kept watching this movie every single day. Especially when I got this 4K version, I was watching this every day. Um... Man, I don't really know how else to explain it, but I it just I just fell in love with it. I love the whole atmosphere of it. Um, the love story with Deckard and Rachel. You know, some people don't kind of like the love story, but I think it's a great love story. Um, there's the one scene, the love scene, you know what I'm talking about, where it seems like he's kind of forcing himself on her. I thought that was kind of weird, especially in this day and age. Because I'm like, that, why is he forcing himself on her? But if you actually look at the scene, he's actually not really forcing himself on her. He's actually trying to get her uh, programming to not... Uh, if you notice, they actually say a few things between each other when he looks like he's forcing himself on her. Um, where she's like trying to tell him that it, her programming is actually stopping her from being a human and doing human things. And he's trying to actually help her. He sees that she wants him too. So it's not really like a rape scene. Some people call it a rape scene. But anyways, um, yeah, I love their story, um, Rachel and Deckard. Um, you know, the origami thing too, uh, right there, the ending of the movie. I love that this movie also doesn't have the stupid happy ending that the theatrical cut, uh, did, um, yeah, this, I, I can't, I really can't explain it, like, you know, you would think that because it's my number one movie now, I'd really have a lot to say, but, you know, I kind of did say a lot, but I, I can't really express how it's my number one now, uh, you know, this movie's easy to watch, too, in my opinion, it just goes by super fast for me, um, it's very atmospheric, too, like I said, sometimes I watch the movie when I go to sleep, um, was raining outside, Put this movie on. Uh, I don't know, man. It's it's main, It's got to be that tears and rain scene. I'm telling you, it's such a beautiful scene, a beautiful moment when the bird flies away. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> I can't explain it. Just Blade Runner is a pure masterpiece. Um, and I said when I reviewed 2049, I thought 2049 was a little better. You could argue that it's better. But since then, I've watched this so many times, and I've watched 2049 many times also more since I got the Blu-ray. Um, but I'm, I'm sure of it. This one's better. Uh, yeah, man. It's a masterpiece. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, yeah, it's dystopian, but it's beautiful. So, yeah, Blade Runner. Just <laughs> That's all I have to say. I can't, I can't explain it more, but... Anyways, Blade Runner is my favorite movie of all time, so that's just how it is now. I can't believe I'm saying that, because Good, the Bad, and the Ugly has been my favorite movie for, like, seven years, eight years, something like that. So, yeah. Anyways, that's it. That's my list. What would you think of it? Um, if you have any agreements or disagreements, please leave them in the comments below. Um, and I really want to see what people have to say about my uh, opinion on uh, Apocalypse Now. Anybody else see it that way, that it's the best film ever made? Because of, you know, pretty much all it took to get made and how the movie itself is an epic masterpiece also. Um, yeah, anyways. Yeah, that's my list right there. Thanks for watching this whole thing. If you watched all three parts, you are the MVP. I wish I could give you a hug. I can give you a virtual hug. Okay, that was, that was weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, so thanks for watching this whole video. Watching all three videos, hopefully. And leave some comments I'd like to discuss. So, thank you guys. You're awesome. That has been my top 30 favorite movies, and also 11, right, honorable mentions. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.